Am I on? I'm on. Right, that's a good start. Let me just uh, warm up my PC a second, because uh, while we're still here, right. And while I'm warming up my PC, let's see if everything comes. Slideshow. Uh, Do we have it working there? Is it going to come? Well, yes, it is. Good afternoon, everybody. Delighted to be here this afternoon. It's, it's almost big enough to actually play a game of football. Um, and in fact, uh, a little bit later on, I haven't... Let me see, I tucked it away somewhere. I've got an England football shirt to give away, but I'll tell you more about that in just a second. Somebody's going to win one. I didn't have enough for everybody, but just one person. If you can answer the, uh, the right question uh, a little bit later on during the course of my presentation. Now, you, you might think uh, that computer security is actually a a strange topic, uh, particularly where the World Cup is on. For example, the hacker group Anonymous have uh, threatened to disrupt the World Cup. And uh, in fact, uh, if they do, I mean, based on the Twitter sentiment out there, it'll probably go worldwide very quickly indeed if they, they manage to do something disruptive. Now, as England failed to make an encouraging start uh, in the match this weekend, I, of course, have a shirt to give away. And uh, there'll be a very precise question in about to 10 slides time. Now, just before I start uh, with this presentation on, on the nature of risk, uh, I want to warn you, I have absolutely no sense of humour. My wife has actually told me that on no account, no account should I try and risk telling a joke, because it takes me back to a presentation I gave in uh, Korea, ooh, about eight, nine years ago, when I had to follow on from the chairman of Samsung. Now, a Korean audience, they don't have much in the way of a sense of humour, or if they do, you can't see that they've got a sense of humour. They're very, very polite. And so I had this lovely young Korean interpreter. And I thought, she's very good. I'm going to risk telling an English joke. And so I did. And I was very surprised that during the simultaneous translation, everybody laughed. I was very surprised. So at the end of the presentation, I went up to the young interpreter and said, how on earth did you manage to translate my joke from English into idiomatic Korean? And she replied, it was very, very easy, really. She said, I tell them he making joke now, please laugh. <laughs> That's as far as I get with my sense of humor. OK, this month uh, we celebrated the 70th anniversary of D-Day. But very few people know how close we came to losing the Battle of the Atlantic against the U-boat, German U-boat threat. Some 3,000 ships were sunk from Allied convoys, and it was only the rapid evolution of countermeasures, and in particular airborne radar, which allowed just enough troops and raw material and supplies to get through to make D-Day possible. Now, while most of us know that codebreakers at Bletchley Park cracked the German Enigma code, which gave the Allies an advantage, certainly, in the Battle of the Atlantic, very people, few people know, actually, that uh, the Germans had actually cracked the convoy code, which allowed them to string their wolf packs of submarines across the Atlantic and uh, intercept uh, the different ships, particularly vulnerable. And in the light of Edward Snowden's revelations a year ago this week, cracking codes is actually a subject that resonates today. And I'm going to come to this very shortly. Now, an analogy exists between the height of the U-boat war in 1943 and the present state of the information security threat in 2014, except that instead of large ships being sent to the bottom of the Atlantic by hidden enemy threat measured in tonnage, large corporations are being sunk with near identical regularity, but measured in gigabytes and terabytes of data. Having their confidential data, their intellectual property, and reputations torpedoed by an invisible army of highly organized and frequently well-funded hacker groups. Everyone needs to pre prepare for the unpredictable. And looking at this slide, this means having, as you heard a little bit earlier, the resilience to withstand uh, unforeseen high-impact threats. There are threats in the context of the most valuable resources in your organization and indeed anybody else's. And you can add to this the explosion in connected consumer internet devices, the internet of things, a loss of the boundary between work and one's personal data, government surveillance activities, and treating security claims for the cloud with a healthy degree of caution. The super soup snooping flame malware mentioned in this slide is widely thought to have been part of the same operation 
that spawned something called Stuxnet, an intelligent weapon specifically engineered to destroy the fuel centrifuges at an Iranian nuclear reactor. Now, Stuxnet could be the topic for a 45-minute talk on its own, and has been. It was a wonderfully complex piece of malware, like none the world had ever seen before. It had at least four unknown new zero-day threats that nobody knew about. It utilized digital signatures with the private keys of two certificates stolen from separate well-known companies and worked on all versions of the Windows operating system down to the decade-old Windows 95. Stuxnet was specifically tailored to target Iranian centrifuges using Siemens controllers and yet ended up spreading to well over 25,000 other SCADA computers around the world and SCADA, as everybody knows here, stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition. Before long, other variants were being repurposed on the sophisticated code it revealed. How did you go bankrupt? The author Ernest Hemingway was once asked. In two ways, he said, gradually and then suddenly. And if you have big data being stored in your organization, Anything of financial or intellectual value, and in fact, you can bet that somebody will very soon try to steal it. Perhaps they've stolen it already, and you don't know about it yet. Consider for a moment the lesson of Snapchat, which most famously rejected a $3 billion acquisition offer from Facebook. It reportedly had some 30 million users as of December, but had a really, really bad start to 2014. Less than a week after it was revealed that a software bug could allow hackers to steal users' personal data from that messaging service, a couple of hackers went straight ahead and stole 4.5 million usernames and phone numbers, posting them online as a downloadable database. Now, cybersecurity threats have, in the period of just over a year, reportedly jumped from number 12 on the Lloyd's Risk Index to number 3, and these are followed by high taxation, loss of customers, reputational damage, and more. This month, it was claimed that in the UK, 80%, 80% of businesses had been compromised by hackers or viruses. Last year, the security company Trend Micro reported an increase of focused attacks. Hundreds of millions of threats were blocked from infecting small businesses, but large companies proved equally vulnerable. A recent study of cyber espionage has demonstrated that some 200 families of malware have been designed and used to spy on government and corporate representatives. And these have been assisted in their diffusion uh, by new agents that work in an automated botnet architecture, as new variants especially designed uh, are specifically developed for selected targets. Over the last five years, most data security threats have reflected a mix of sophisticated cyber attacks and poor organizational policies. Last year, you may recall, the US retailer Target was hit by one of the biggest data breaches in the industry's history, when as many as 40 million customers saw their credit and their debit cards become subject to potential fraud after malware was actually posted into or introduced into the point of sale system in almost 2,000 stores. At much the same time, it was revealed that credit card details from almost half of all South Koreans were stolen and sold to marketing firms with insider collusion. 80% of respondents in a recent survey uh, re reported that their company's own leaders, their board, did not equate losing confidential data with a potential uh, loss of revenue, despite research indicating that the average cost of an organizational data breach is roughly in the region of three million pounds. As the cartoon suggests, a tiny lapse in attention to detail in keeping both policies and patching up to date in any organization can prove really, really expensive and potentially catastrophic as many global brands have discovered over the last 12 months. I, I think we can all see, see the slides, but on the, on one, what it says is, in this corner, we have firewalls, encryption, software, etc., and in the other corner, we have Dave, and Dave, of course, being the weak point in the organization. For those of you who know their Spanish, it's a very serious thing, is a quote from the photographer, again, who was famous on D-Day, 
uh, Robert Capa, also famous in the Spanish Civil War, a contemporary of Hemingway. And today I want to expand a little about the loosening uh, connection between risk, uncertainty and probability in the information security environment. I'll begin with an argument that once upon a time information risk was something that perhaps could attract some kind of actuarial estimate, um, pr a probability, even one which you might attach an insurance premium to. But today this seems, for many people, rather challenging indeed. Most recently, what we might understand as information risk has been replaced by a near sense of random uncertainty as governments and businesses no longer really have a clear idea of who they are protecting their most critical assets from, what the rapidly evolving exploits might next be used against them. And just over a week ago, the UK's National Crime Agency, you may have seen on TV in the papers, took the quite unprecedented step of warning the public against a threat due to trigger next week, as you can see in the slide. Over the years, the Zeus framework has so worried the FBI and our own uh, National Crime Agency, it's evolved from focusing on the harvesting of banking credentials to being used in the control of hosts, zombies, if you like, for many types of crime, including customized attacks to target the platform-specific services and software-as-a-service infrastructures of very, very large companies. Game over, Zeus, which, is the UK, well, which the UK population has now been warned about, differs from those traditional botnets where infected devices are controlled by a central server, which makes them vulnerable to seizures and shutdowns of that server. Instead, uh, Game Over Zeus, uh, the subject of last month's crackdown by the FBI, is what we call a peer-to-peer -peer botnet. It's far trickier to eliminate because it's so decentralized. Now, take the stealth, the creativity, and the patience of Stuxnet, and the commercialization, wide distribution, and easy-to-use toolkits of Zeus, and consider for a moment that despite more than five years of activity, none of the really, really big criminal masterminds behind these exploits have actually been exposed. You now understand the recipe and the potency of today's malware, and a $20 billion security industry is looking increasingly nervous as a consequence. We all have to start planning for tomorrow, because it's going to take more than signatures and operating system level protections to protect reputations and intellectual property and other assets against criminals wielding these weapons. Rather like my wolf pack analogy at the beginning of the presentation. There are, according to MI5's head of cybersecurity, three certainties in life you'll see on the slide. There's death, there's taxes, and there's a foreign intelligence agency sitting in your system. In August 2007, uh, a young programmer in Microsoft's uh, Windows Security Group stood up to give a five-minute talk at the annual crypto conference in Santa Barbara. His topic was something called dual ECDRBG, or dual elliptic curve deterministic random bit generator. First time I've been able to say that successfully. This is a pseudo-random number generator that was promoted as cryptographically secure by the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States. Now, his talk was only nine slides long, but those nine slides were potentially dynamite. They laid out a case showing that a new encryption standard, given a stamp of approval by the US government, possessed a glaring weakness that made an algorithm in it susceptible to cracking. But the weakness they described was not just your average vulnerability, it had the kind of properties one would want if one wanted to intentionally insert a backdoor to make the algorithm susceptible to cracking by design. So what does this mean? Okay. Imagine if every burger alarm in Britain had a secret pin code. In 2007, it caused a ripple of concern, but in 2013, that ripple became a tidal wave of worry as it was revealed that cracking by design may have been a feature of web traffic for years. And this is what was discovered a year ago this week with the revelations of the former NSA operative William Snowden, which alleged that many of the world's largest software and security companies had been partners, if not complicit, in undermining the security and privacy of the Internet. What this revealed 
was nothing less than a flawed or badly broken internet security model. And this is the new post-Snowden reality that each and every one of us has to live with. This brings me to the novelist George Orwell, who possessed a, a remarkable gift with words, and a quote shown on the slides illustrates where we stand today. Orwell said, we've now sunk to a depth at which restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. Everything about the safety of the internet as a common communications medium has been shown to be broken. As with the banking disasters of 2008, the crisis and damage caused not by Edward Snowden, but by the unregulated and unrestrained conduct of national security agencies will last for decades, if not years. The United States NSA's explicit objective was to weaken the security of the entire physical fabric of the internet. And one of its declared goals was to shape the worldwide commercial cryptography market to make it more tractable to advance cryptoanalytic capabilities being developed by that organization. When Edward Snowden started leaking information, top secret classified information from the US intelligence agencies, we started learning about programs such as Dishfire and Prism and XKeyscore, among others. And only this month, the Guardian newspaper revealed that Vodafone, one of the world's largest mobile phone groups, has secret wires that allow government agencies to listen to all the conversations on its networks, saying that they are widely used in some 29 countries in which it operates, in Europe and beyond. I'm sure many of us here, myself included, are old enough to remember James Burke. Okay, 1999. Every, 19, every second, nine new pieces of malware are discovered. And even the intelligence agencies of nation states have been found to be buying what they call zero-day flaws in software. One such exploit in Apple's internet operating system reportedly sold for 500,000 US dollars, an exploit that nobody knew about. In 1973, um, the popular TV presenter, you see on the slide there, James Burke, demonstrate a simple hacking into a bank's computer program to transfer any fractional amount after the 16th decimal point into a personal account. As a young boy, I found that absolutely fascinating. Ironically, the same exploit has been used or reinvented in the shadowy world of the Bitcoin, as fractions of Bitcoins have now started mysteriously jumping from wallet to wallet, rather like grasshoppers on a frying pan. Now it's time for somebody to win that football shirt. The gentleman in the picture is Dr. Alan Solomon, and we used to do business together. And that was in the late 1980s, and one summer's afternoon, he called me at home with an idea. PCs were quickly starting to become network, and the very first simple worms were starting to appear, the Morris worm being among them. Alan thought this might have a major implication for the future, and suggested running a conference on the subject in London, which we actually did. I recall contacting all the largest insurance companies in an attempt to interest them in what might be a potential threat. Maybe they would be interested in some kind of policy support. But at the time, the early days of the, the PC, I suppose, nobody was interested. Antivirus software lines of code, once measured in the thousands two decades ago, now average in excess of some 10 million lines, almost a Moore's law in its own right. By contrast, malware has remained relatively short and simple. How many lines of code do you think this might be on average? So, antivirus lines of code, about a million. What do you think the average length of an ordinary virus line of code is? How long do you think it is, in contrast to a million? Let's have a show of hands. Let's try 10 hands up. We've got a million for one. Defenders have a million lines of code. How many lines of code do the bad guys have? Somebody take a guess. Shout. 10,000 lines of code. I hear 10,000 over there. Adva 100. Who said 100? 100 over there? 50 over there? 15 is a bit ambitious. Okay, that's really condensed. Anybody else? 25. I think we need to go up here. Let's take two more. 500. Not bad. 1,000 and 100. Well, so he said 100. Any advance on 100 between 500? 250. We'll take the 250. All right. The actual answer is 1 million on one side, averaging 110 lines of code on the other side. 
So the gentleman over there gets the English shirt. Come on, there we are. You put his hand up. He's just over there. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. He's just there. Put your hand up, sir. I haven't got any more, I'm sorry. But you're, you're expected to play on Thursday, I think. So we're flying you out there now. All right. In fact, as I said there, it's condensed into some 125 lines of code. So you think about that. The attacker only has to get in through one node once to potentially compromise all the defensive efforts. There's a huge asymmetry there, isn't there? The infamous love bug worm released in uh, May 2000 caused the largest outages and damage to the internet-connected PCs to date. The so big F virus was released in August 2003. And within two days, it had counted for all the approximate, well, 70% of all the email in the world. It was pretty successful. One analysis of antivirus software found that over an eight-day period, while over 100,000 new signatures of a known malware were added by major antivirus vendors into the list of things they were lurching for or to scan for, only 12 new detections resulted. As the number of attacks grows over time, the definition files and the time it takes to search them also grows. How many people have noticed their PC really starts to slow down? Yeah? Marta, you had antivirus on there for a long time. It's because it's getting big and bigger and bigger, and it's trying to get through all these new viruses and problems that are coming out on a daily basis. Most of these old signatures don't represent current threats, and as the threats proliferate, it becomes a losing game. Last month, Symantec became the first antivirus company to admit it could no longer keep up with the threats. Cyber threats have grown exponentially in effort and complexity, but they continue to be defeated by the offences that require far less investment by the attacker. Go back in history a bit. At times, users might be forgiven with an analogy of the old healthy smoking adverts of the 1950s and the 1960s, where smoking 40 cigarettes a day was really quite safe, and it was advertised by smiling doctors. In 2010, McAfee thought it was impressive that it was discovering a new specimen of malware every 15 minutes. In 2013, it was discovering one every single second. One has to ask the impossible question in 2014, whether it's now cheaper to take the hit than implement the system to fix the problem. Remember that Target had 110 million customers compromised and adequate PCI, payment card industry, and DSS standards are frequently the cause of such high-profile failures, which now appear on an almost month-by-month -month basis. Most of us are ignorant of the true scale of the darker side of the Internet, and we only scratch its surface. What if I would tell you that Google and other search engines can only search a fraction of the web? And this number varies from source to source. But the most generous term I've heard uh, is that Google can search about 10% uh, of the World Wide Web. So you ask, what's in the other 90%? Well, that other 90% goes by many different names. The dark net, the invisible web, the dark web, the deep web, the deep net, and so on. The deep web is that chunk of cyberspace which lies beyond the reach of search engines. It's a place where everything is for sale. The other side of the internet is made up of a large mass of different things. This is basically everything that today's search engines can't make sense of, and is normally accessed by anonymized browsers like Tor. For instance, there's a lot of database information, there's dynamic content like temporary web pages, and other obscure data that sites like Google simply don't deal with. One of the largest markets in the deep web was recently shut down by the FBI, and that marketplace you may have heard about was called Silk Road. This was an underground website that has been described as the, the Amazon or the eBay where you could find the most dangerous, addictive, sordid, and illicit material you might ever imagine. However, buying weapons and drugs online is now far easier since the shutting down of Silk Road in 2013 because a dozen new sites have just simply taken its place. When the Silk Road website was taken down by the FBI, the closure took out some 13,500 different drug deals, according to research by a US online safety group. 
Yet today, the dark web is teeming with dozens of new markets and thousands of new dealers serving a growing consumer base and an almost threefold increase in dark neck drug dealing has been seen in just eight months. As well as Silk Road now, police forces world might have to add new sites. There's Agora, there's Evolution, there's Pandora, there's Blue Sky, there's Hydra, and let's just name a few. So you say, well, nothing about this sounds good, so why is it still around? Well, for one, websites and, and the traffic running over them is anonymized over this part of the internet. Traffic hops from server to server, which obscures the original source. This makes it very, very difficult indeed to take anything down because it's next to impossible to find out where the next website is being hosted. More and more individuals are looking to the dark net to make their internet communications anonymous, and often it's for completely legitimate purposes, such as political ask activists who may wish to communicate over the network in countries such as the Middle East and China. Thanks to Moore's law of 1965, processors are about a thousand times more powerful than they were 40 years ago. But perhaps more importantly, and invisibly, the algorithms, the underlying code, and the processes that dominate the information age are reportedly 43,000 times more powerful. And this has implications for us all. The internet, which you can see vaguely on that slide, is now dominated by bot traffic. And the threats we face, like Game Over Zeus, are increasingly automated, working efficiently and invisibly on a scale which impacts millions of personal computers. Theft has been democratized on an industrial scale by clever algorithms. And that's just about quoting Ian Lobben from GCHQ. The key difference in these automated attacks is one of cost, both from the attackers and from the defender's point of view. For the attacker, automation hugely reduces costs as they don't have to invest in all the tasks needed from selecting the victim to identifying the asset to coordinating the attack. Botnets now represent as much as 60% of the internet traffic and the sums of money they are stealing are becoming eye-watering. There's Citadel, that stole about half a billion dollars. Cutwell, $16 billion apparently. Game Over Zeus, $64 million, and Spy Eye, I'll talk about that in a moment, still undetermined, zero access, a mere $80 million. So by 2013, an average large business of 1,000 employees or more was spending roughly $6 million a year on cybersecurity, and cybersecurity researchers have still identified that the top 50 crimeware sites, the distributing ISPs, are still running from the United States, despite the best efforts of the FBI. Let's remind ourselves that as many as 100,000 automated new viruses may have appeared today. 30,000 new websites may have been affected by automated, uh, automated bots. And from the chart, you can see, if you can read it at all, how the nature of the threat is evolving and adapting, much like any virus in the physical world. When I started the E-Crime Congress some 13 years ago, it was script kiddies. These were people or experts who knew how to code. They knew the inside and the outside of the system. Now, they just grab components, put them together, or they just get an automated system to do it for them, and they fire it at their target. They don't actually have to know very much at all about computing. And of the compromised, 80% of these are small businesses used very often as targets to capture the unwary, like a Chinese restaurant's website in, Sa in uh, San Francisco, used as a, to actually infect and target workers who might be working for the big IT companies, what they call a watering hole. Some of them, of course, are as newsworthy as the UK's own National Health Service, which was found to be crawling with nasty little exploits, much like the fleas on the back of a dog. Business remains broadly trapped between more traditional and reactive postures. Company N in the slide is an example uh, of a serious vulnerability exposing that same business for a month of opportunity, um, and it lost an awful lot of data. And one key example was the Canadian company Nortel, that people may recall. Um, it employed 100,000 people, and its chief executive's account was hacked. This was only discovered by accident by an information security employee in the London office, 
who noticed repeated attempts to access the highest level access files, and then called up uh, the chief executive's office in Canada and said, I know you're trying to access these files. You seem to be having problems. Uh, can I help you? And then they found that uh, 1,500 documents that are stolen. Remote activity came from China, according to the IP logs, specifically from Shanghai and Beijing. And somebody had been living in the system for four years. In 2009, Nortel filed for bankruptcy. And you have to ask, who had the competitive advantage as a consequence? Now, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers, say companies are not keeping pace with the cybercrime threat. In 2013 alone, some 86% of websites had a serious vulnerability, and it took an average of 193 days to detect and remediate the problem. The average number of vulnerabilities for websites is now 56. The worst of these, apparently, are IT websites with an average of some 114 unpatched vulnerabilities per site. From the chart, you may not make out the detail there, but you can see there's rather too much red in terms of exposure among different types or categories of companies to vulnerability across a range of industries. The worst are healthcare, social media and online dating, and charity websites that are among the most compromised. Some of you who watched the BBC Panorama programme in September of last year may have seen the programme on Cupid. Um, it was reported that some 42 million uh, client account passwords were stolen by the Cupid dating site, which is very popular in the UK. In fact, I actually went over to Ukraine. I was doing a, a seminar over there in September. The details were discovered on the same server, which was used as a dump site by hackers who also broke into the big US software giant Adobe. Now, just under 2 million of the Cupid users used 123456 as their password. Just over a million used, very cleverly, 111111 as their passwords, and the very clever ones, of which there are 91,000, selected I love you as their password. The security industry likes to paint an image of internet security in depth, much like the layered defense of a United States carrier battle group, protecting its largest strategic asset, the aircraft carrier. But the reality we're facing today is rather closer to the story of the Maersk Alabama in the movie Captain Phillips, where the risk is represented by a very small, well-funded and well-organized asymmetric threat, which is not deterred by expensive countermeasures. Looking at the slide, these are just some of the headline stories of the last three months. Heartbleed gave cynics another reason to doubt that privacy could be protected on the internet. The United States most recently indicted several Chinese army officers from Unit 61398, the Shanghai Group, which I will come to shortly. There's also another group of Chinese out there too. Anonymous Ukraine said it has information on more than 800 million credit cards and has leaked the first million of these onto a public forum. And of course, most of us here will know that eBay was itself compromised and but took a rather long time to tell its customers to change their passwords. And it rather begs the question, if eBay with 128 million users with their, compromised, with their details compromised can't protect its customer data, then who can? The landscape of cybercrime today looks a little bit like this. And there are three distinct threats. At the top, the presence of organized criminal groups who are becoming increasingly sophisticated and specialized. Silk Road apparently did a roaring trade in uh, Tesco Club Cow vouchers as well as drugs and guns. Attacks are increasing in both size and complexity, but the old embedded Windows XP is still out there, and there's still an, a significant opportunity around ATM and point of sale devices. And you may have seen in the newspapers on the BBC the other day that some Canadian school kids in their lunch hours managed to hack ATMs, I think, using Windows XP. Nation-sponsored uh, intelligence gathering activities are also a worry for large companies with intellectual property to protect. And I'll return to the Second Bureau of the uh, Third Army of the People's Liberation Army, 61398, a little bit later on. Law professions, solicitors, are deeply worried by the threat to intellectual property. Uh, at the end of last year, I did a presentation uh, to a conference of uh, solicitors in London who are looking after 
client privilege information, patent information, intellectual property, and they're starting to realize that perhaps somebody may have been living in their system for some time and they may not, being the legal expression, have had the strength and depth that might be required of them. And of course, there are non-state and crowdsourced actors like Anonymous and Operation Ababil, uh, which remain a potent threat. Ababil was a, a series of cyber attacks starting in 2012 targeting various American financial institutions and carried out by a group calling themselves the Cyber Fighters of Is Ad Din Al Qassam. And they also have a botnet called Brobot. And let's not, of course, forget the Iranian cyber attack against the Saudi, uh, the Saudi Aramco complex, which trashed some 30,000 workstations. And then there's the Syrian Electronic Army, also possibly backed by Iran, which is both extremely active and capable. Channel 4 News, as you know, doesn't pack any punches, particularly with the news coverage, whether it be the award-winning coverage of the killing fields or the devastation of uh, the war in, Sri um, in Syria. Unsurprisingly, last year, it attracted the attention of the Syrian Electronic Army and had to fend off a concerted and directed attack on its web presence and its network. <coughs> what happened to Channel 4 was revealed at the Crime Congress in London when they came along and told us. One of its journalists was fished, and this was an unpatched vulnerability in a WordPress blog which revealed a login and a password which now allowed the attackers into the news channel system and from where there they proceeded to cause havoc. Um, the fish you can probably just make out on the link there on the slide was a simple masked URL which redirected to a website which carried the, the password. And this came down to not having protected WordPress vlogs on the Channel 4 site. Law enforcement is struggling with resources as new kinds of devices proliferate. Identity theft continues to rise. Simultaneously, data breaches are growing with the danger that once released onto the web, much like the stolen revelations, stolen data becomes, or faces the risk, of becoming infinitely distributed. An American company hired a Pentagon-qualified security firm to clean its infected network after being targeted by an advanced persistent threat. And despite this, a few months later, a thermostat and a printer in its building were caught sending messages to a server located in China. Now, remember my earlier mention of the PLA 61398, the, the comment crew or the Shanghai group? This is a key unit tasked with gathering political, economic, and military-related intelligence on the United States through cyber means. In 2013, it was caught stealing employee passwords to break into the New York Times computer networks. The New York Times then had its revenge by publishing a series of embarrassing exposés. The paper revealed that the Chinese unit was behind some 141 APT attacks across 20 different industries, targeting everybody from Coca-Cola to the Pentagon, even the United Nations. And 61398 even had the indignity of having its long, or no longer secret headquarters splashed across the newspaper's front page. Let me see if this works a second. Just give you an example of i get two minutes on this one to show a Chinese operator hacking into a site. Let's see if this works. Welcome to a special presentation by Mandiant's Threat Intelligence Center. The series of videos shows a live APT-1 Chinese threat actor conducting computer network espionage activities. We will see him take a variety of actions affecting real victims. All identities have been anonymized to protect the innocent. This video shows the APT-1 actor Dota creating an operational email account. He is using a US IP address to sign up for the account. Notice that he initially leaves his country location as the default United States. However, Google then asks Dota for a verification phone number, and Dota changes his country location to China. He then inputs the phone number 159-2193-7729, where the 2193 indicates a number that China Mobile allocated to Shanghai. Dota immediately provides a verification code showing that he had the phone with him at the time. Here we see Dota logging into one of his operational email accounts. He has used this account for spear phishing and generating additional email accounts. The inbox shows confirmation emails for additional accounts that Dota created, as well as bounces and non-delivery receipts for spear phishing messages, most of which seem to be focused on military exercises in the Philippines. Notice that Gmail generates a suspicious login warning, 
informing DOTA that the IP address 58.247.245.236, which is part of one of apt ones home ranges, was used to log into the account. DOTA now moves to a sent mailbox, which shows... Okay, I, I think you get the idea there, don't you? So that's one person doing it. Here's another one. One criminal who um, purchased the banking Trojan SpyEye reportedly made $3.2 million in six months. To remind ourselves, um, I mentioned earlier on, SpyEye was the preeminent banking Trojan between 2009 and 2011. It accounted for over one and a quarter million infections, 100,000 plus bank accounts were compromised, 150 cybercrime gangs were known to be involved in attacking multiple countries. Uh, in July of last year, Alexander Panin, pictured there, uh, made the mistake of flying through Atlanta in the United States. And on January 28th this year, uh, Panin pleaded guilty to conspiracy and bank fraud. Um, he's now enjoying the delights of a federal penitentiary with lots of new friends. Uh, he's no longer in a position to create uh, the next malicious bot net, but his place has been taken by hundreds like him. He was running a truly global network. And staying with good customer services, the next video. Um, this young man's rather different from Alexander Panin, but it shows what is available out there at the touch of a button or just spending a few dollars. I'll try and get this one going. Here we go. So you're here for one reason, and that reason is, is because you need your business competitors, rivals, haters, or whatever the reason is, or who, they are to go down. Well, you, my friend, you've came to the right place. If you want your business competitors to go down, well, they can. If you want your rivals to go offline, well, they will. Not only that, we are providing a short-term to long-term DDoS service or scheduled attack starting $5 per hour for small personal websites to $10 to $50 per hour for huge DDoS protected websites. Prices may depend on how huge the website is or how protected it is. With four years of DDoS and experience and several years of studying on DDoS protection, you cannot go wrong. But what I'm saying is we are capable of handling the sites for days, weeks, months. Just email us at gwapo at hackforums at hackforums.net or add us on Messenger. We I think you get the idea. A bit of a contrast between the difference the Chinese and, and Guapo, but there are lots of people like him around. You can find him on the web and he'll happily provide a service for you or anybody else out there if you wish to take down somebody's website. And it's cheap. And he has access to all those new and automated tools. Um, maybe except Bitcoin as well. It becomes increasingly untraceable. And that is a sort of sophisticated, evolving nature of threat. It has become democratized. So, we're at a crisis point now, with also in regard to the security of embedded systems, where security itself is embedded into the hardware. As with the Internet of Things, these embedded computers are riddled with vulnerabilities, and there's no good way to patch them. On December 23rd last year, uh, Proofpoint uh, uncovered um, what may be the first proven Internet of Things-based cyber attack involving conventional household smart appliances. Uh, the global attack campaign involved more than 750,000 malicious email communications targeting enterprises and individuals worldwide. More than 25% of the volume was sent by things that were not conventional laptops. Instead, the emails were sent by everyday consumer gadgets such as compromised home routers, connected multimedia networks, TVs, and at least one refrigerator. Brian House and Kyle McDonald's creation, the cover snitch, you can see in the illustration there, impersonates a light bulb or a lamp, while eavesdropping on and in live tweeting nearby conversations. Now, the cover snitch, uh, which is built for less than $100, resembles a light bulb, and it listens in on these conversations and then posts snippets of the transcribed audio um, out to the web. Um, basically, anything can be broadcast via this kind of ubiquitous internet listening device. And it's actually done with the, the Raspberry Pi miniature computer, a microphone, an LED, and a plastic flower pot. Cheap to do, cheap to run. Such is the concern within the UK government that our intellectual property advantage might disappear or our financial institutions compromise, or may be compromised as a consequence of data theft 
that uh, CESG, the information security arm of GCHQ, is now involved in assisting some of the largest companies and institutions. It's just released, as you can see on the slide, a, a number of sensible recommendations that in particular focus on the risks presented by the cost-based stampede towards a cloud-based um, computing environment. Some of these are familiar enough and they fall under the category of the obvious in a world where the obvious has clearly failed dismally to date. Consumer data transiting networks should be adequately protected against tampering and eavesdropping. Well, this is integrity and confidentiality. And this should be via a combination of network protection, denying the attacker access to intercept data, and of course, using encryption, and denying the ability for the attacker to read the data once he's stolen it. But the most interesting one for me is at the end of the 14-point program they provide of suggestions. It says secure use of the service by the consumer. And it says consumers have, a, have certain responsibilities when using a cloud service in order for the use of it to remain secure and for their data to be adequately protected. And I'm wondering if we're starting to see this emphasis coming up from financial institutions as well as to where the responsibility for the breach lies. Supply chain, consumer, customer, you name it. So let me leave you with a handful of remarks as I come towards the end. Best practices are no guarantee of safety, although it's wise to actually develop, uh, invest in secure defense in depth where you can. Don't ignore best practice, because we're living in an age of mitigation and remediation, uh, and that's the fundamental change. After all, after all, we're thinking of a world where perhaps 80% of companies may have been hacked or may be in the process of being hacked or compromised or may be under attack. The odds aren't good. Assign an individual or a group that is, of course, accountable for a website security. Examine all the websites, all of them, and prioritize which are the most important websites that need defending. Measure your current security posture from an attacker's perspective. You saw two videos there, you saw Guapo and you saw the Chinese operator. You need to see it from their point of view. Very importantly, like Channel 4 News that was compromised by an unpatched uh, WordPress blog, you need to, to try and tr um, trend and track the life cycle of the vulnerabilities. You saw it's taking too long now, between 150 and 300 days, to patch the vulnerabilities across a big corporate website. WordPress is the finest example of the lot. And for many businesses now, and indeed for the security industry, I'm seeing the emphasis is on fast detection and response. It appears to be the way forward. So in conclusion, there's, there's no easy answer. I can only quote George Orr once again when he said, progress is not an illusion. It happens, but it's slow, and it's invariably disappointing. And in the security space, disappointment is something we all increasingly need to live with until someone comes up with a better idea than simply running constant penetration sweeps and tests against one's network to try and shake out those persistent operators, those persistent compromises, and all those, those persistent fleas which seem to be gathering on there on a week-by-week, month-by-month basis. Undetected. Thank you for listening. I've got time to take some questions, and it's been a great pleasure. Any questions from the audience here? There's a gentleman in the front. Thank you. Um, apart from all going back to using paper and pencil, which seems about the only option, um, is there a hello? Um, is there a, uh, a likelihood that uh, the cost of security actually outweighs the um, commercial viability of an organisation? That's a very good question, and I think I alluded to it uh, at the earlier on in the presentation when I say that the cost is becoming high. Um, I, when I used to write for Computer Weekly, I referred to the, the, um, the show, big show at Olympia, Infosec, because I'm Spartacus, because everybody was standing up and saying, you know, I'm Spartacus, I can do it, no, I can do it. And it, it's kind of evolved to how many people know Life of Brian? Yeah, we, we've all seen that too. But the problem is cost, because... There is no simple and easy solution. Each year you have an, an industry 
with a range of solutions, some good, some poor, but increasingly less able to guarantee that an organization can be protected from a persistent and prevalent threat. And as you say quite correctly, there has to be a balance there. You have to, you have a duty, you have an obligation to make sure that you have PCI and DSS standards and all the other appropriate standards in place. That is unavoidable. But the cost appears to be coming increasingly high. The other problem, and um, we're seeing it more and more, is there's probably a shortage of about 2 million security people out there. As the technology becomes more sophisticated, as organizations become more reliant, and particularly on the cloud now, they need high-profile individuals. And many of these guys, and I know them by name, and uh, they've spoken at many conferences I've been at. You could be the, IT, it could be the CSO of BP or of Chrysler or of Rolls-Royce and elsewhere. They're now starting to command sort of salaries and performance like superstars. And I know that they, they move around some of these large companies. So there's kind of a premier league of, of people who look after large organizations. And then, then it moves down from there. But there are not sufficient skilled people to take up the slack for an industry which is relying increasingly on security solutions and on actually having the people who understand how to mitigate and remediate them. And that's a problem. And probably that's a problem for the insurance industry. Not only in making sure the standards are in place, but the company has the right person in place to actually deal with the threat if and when it comes along. And you know, if I was gambling, an 80% probability against me is not good. 50-50, you know, well, playing poker or so. The best poker players probably work on about 5% probability on their player, on their, in their favor. The rest of you know, the fish out there playing online poker. The probability isn't good anymore. So it's remediation, mitigation, fast analysis, and fast response. That was a long answer. Gentlemen over there. What percentage of the attacks are for commercial gain and what percentage are for either political or for anarchic attack because they can do it? I think that's a difficult answer to give. Uh, it's not one I have the, I hate to say it, I don't have the answer. Um, if it's the Chinese, uh, allegedly, then there's this, I think the American government referred to it. They're used to the government spying for intelligence purposes. For example, you saw the example there on military exercises in the Philippines. But increasingly, the Chinese are, uh, are spying for intellectual property reasons. And I think in 2007, um, I did the first presentation on what the Chinese were up to at the IDG conference in Milan because the FBI um, released some information and made it non-classified. This was the first time we started to see this coming out. And fundamentally... If you think of all the big brands in Europe, you know, Ducati being one, and you think of Rolls-Royce perhaps being another one, and others, um, they all had noticed that intellectual property had started to become a focus. In the United States, the stealth program, Lockheed Martin, big contact. In fact, um, I did one presentation, and uh, a very well-known defense contractor, um, United States one, told me that they were now writing their own software and their own firewalls because they no longer, he said, this was the CISO, Chief Information Security Officer, he said, we no longer have any confidence in commercially available firewalls and software, so we're writing our own now, because we don't know that actually the commercial stuff's been compromised. Yeah? So that's, uh, and I had a, um, a discussion a couple of years ago when I did a keynote to a conference in Paris with the CEO of another large international um, uh, security company that does a lot of its development work in Taiwan. And I made myself very unpopular by asking him, how do you know that your software hasn't been compromised? Well, it wouldn't be compromised, but it's Taiwan. How, how do you know that it hasn't been compromised? And the answer is, he doesn't know. Is there a back door into everybody's system? Well, probably not, but he can't say for sure. And we're seeing this in this country as well, because in our course, we are now reliant through some of our providers and infrastructure providers on companies which are based on the Far East. And the British government would say so much that there is a concern over certain providers as to whether some of the infrastructure has been provided, has been compromised. Another question? There's a gentleman at the back there. I've got six minutes. Uh, it's just a different strategy, really. A uh, question about false data, because you can't track real data, you don't know where it's come from. But if you have a false name and address in there, and it suddenly pops up, 
you know you've been hacked. What are the benefits of sort of forced data, any plots to lure people away from the real stuff that's happening? That's, that's a very good question. You're talking about salting, obviously, your databases and making sure there's information there. Um, there, there are a number of um, procedures, recommended policies. This is a question asked about over eBay, for example. You know, was all the data encrypted? Was all the data salted? Could they actually tell when data had gone missing? So when, obviously, you're looking after large amounts of data, that you, you have a means of knowing that, that it could well have been stolen. Many companies um, don't, haven't gone that far, and they need to go that far to actually have routines in place so if information is stolen that they have a way of actually being able to identify what information may have been stolen. Because now we're looking at, look at Target. You know, you can look at huge volumes of data that can disappear into a thumb drive almost overnight. And I mentioned Nortel. Now, 2009, Nortel was a prime example there. That was a huge Canadian telecoms company. And once again, as I asked in the presentation, who had the competitive advantage from seeing Nortel go to the wall and become bankrupt, um, where was it being hacked from? So it's, and as I said, Nortel had somebody in their system for four years. And that the big issue at the moment, and particularly coming out of GCHQ and government and elsewhere, is that we don't know whether we've actually had somebody in the system, and we need to be able to get into the system to determine whether, through the logs, through penetration testing, through detection, whether somebody or something has been living there for a while. And of course, as you say so, more importantly, you need to be able to tell very quickly if it's gone missing. Uh, particularly if you're a, a firm of solicitors in London looking after intellectual property, have you actually lost that intellectual property somewhere? Do you know whether you've lost it? Because according to the information, many companies don't until it's too late. Time for one more question. I think the gentleman here was next. I have a question regarding um, uh, which programs, you know, are, are susceptible to, to being hacked, you know, is it like the financial, the administration, the, uh, is there a, a particular lots uh, programs? Lots of programs are vulnerable to hacking, but the pr fundamental problem is that the infrastructure of the network, the internet itself, was never designed to be secure. And over time, we found more and more insecurities, and the revelations that were re released by Edward Snowden last year have showed that, uh, for example, the National Security Agency of the United States, GCHQ and elsewhere, have found even more opportunities to be able to penetrate the network. To use your iPhone, they can use the microphone, they can use the camera, they can listen in, even when your iPhone's turned off, that type of thing. Um, now, those, now that the world knows that those vulnerabilities exist, the highly organized, sophisticated, and well-funded bad guys also know those vulnerabilities exist. And if they hadn't actually been doing the research, and you can think of the, the Mexican cartels, which are heavily into, into online crime now as well, because they can make more money out of it, as well as drugs, that one funds the other, then they're certainly looking at the exploits to take advantage of those exploits. So to answer your question as briefly as possible, there's no list of what programs can be compromised. Rather, too many programs can be compromised, but it, the, the fear is the infrastructure which gives somebody, like our friend there when you saw the Chinese actor going into Google and then delving down deep into somebody else's system, it gives him opportunity to get into somebody's network, then give himself the administration rights, and then steal the information that he wants from that network, and you may not know it's gone. Last question? Please help. Do you think cybercrime or cyber hacking had anything to do with the loss of the Malaysian aeroplane? Um, no. It's only because I'm, well, I'm, well, I'm not doing this, I'm also a commercial pilot. <laughs> you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> so I'm flying tomorrow, so I, guess I wear two hats sometimes. But uh, no, I don't think so. I think the, that it's a bit like Occam's razor, that uh, we'll find out more um, as time goes on. But uh, no, that, that's, that's a great mystery, and uh, I think it's more likely to be a conventional explanation. I'll give an example um, without going to air crash investigation. Things like pistachio nuts. Pistachio nuts are dangerous goods. Did you know that? 
people know that? Because, of course, the oil in there, it can they can spontaneously combust. So you can't take pistachio nuts on an aircraft. Yeah? So in the same way that a South African flight went down um, many years ago that was carrying arms, allegedly, from South Africa to India, something caught fire in the hold, and the 747 went into the ocean. So it's all speculation. Uh, I don't know, but I think normally the... The most logical explanation is the most likely explanation if we can find out what happened. But I may yet be proved wrong like everybody else out there. Thank you very much, everybody.